Hi everyone, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. few times I'm glad I'm inside because of the rain. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're gonna check in with Kenny to make sure our audio is okay for the recording. Yeah. Sounds we good. Sound okay? Me. Yep. Great. So hello and welcome everyone. Uh, this is our 2019 online Q and A for the MFA in Theater Management and Producing at Columbia University. We are coming to you live from Theater Development Fund <laughs> uh, in Midtown Manhattan, and it is pouring outside. Um, we're doing this live today uh, on December 9th, uh, but we know that many people will log in and watch this video over the course of the year. So if it's a different day, if it's warm and summertime and you're logging in, well, how That's nice for you. <laughs> um, so, uh, give you another few seconds to enjoy the happy, smiling faces of the class of 2018, uh, who graduated last year, and the class of 2020, who will be graduating next spring, and, um, and we can get started. Very good. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so, we are your hosts for this Q&A. Uh, I'm Stephen Chagelson. Uh, I'm a professor in the School of the Arts, and I'm the concentration director for theater management and producing. And I'm Victoria or Tori Bailey. I'm an adjunct professor um, in the theater management and producing program, and I am an advisor, concentration advisor to the program. And as with all the faculty in the program, uh, we have the hat that we wear up at Columbia, and then we have our the other hat that we wear professionally in Midtown or downtown or somewhere in the theater world. And I, um, I run my company called Snug Harbor Productions, where I general manage and produce shows in New York, on and off Broadway, on tours, and internationally. And I am the executive director at Theater Development Fund, or TDF, which is a performing arts service organization that believes that everybody should have access to the arts, and we have a whole host of programs um, that work to build audiences, ensure access. We have education programs, accessibility programs, and ticketing programs, including the one that you may be familiar with, or most familiar with, which is we run the TKTS booth in Times Square. And this Q&A is to tell you about and to answer your questions about the Theater Management and Producing MFA. But before we do that, uh, I always think it's nice to sort of situate you uh, and get you acclimated to what is Columbia University and what is the Columbia University School of the Arts. Uh, we are up at, up, we are in Manhattan, up at 116, 116th Street and Broadway. And we also have a new building, you'll see some pictures of that later, the Lenfest Center of the Arts up on 129th Street. On the screen right now is a picture of Dodge Hall, which is our home at 116th Street. And in Dodge Hall, we have classrooms and offices, faculty offices for all four programs that live within the School of the Arts, film, theater, writing, and visual arts. But zooming in to the theater program itself, uh, we off the theater program offers MFAs in acting, directing, dramaturgy, playwright, playwriting, stage management, theater management and producing. And uh, theater management and producing also has a joint degree program with Columbia Law School, a joint JD MFA 
That's specifically for the theater management and producing concentration, and we will tell you a little bit more about that later uh, in this Q&A. So why look at an MFA? Um, there's a variety of reasons to think about getting a degree. Um, first of all, there's um, an MFA affords you uh, the opportunity to look at the big picture, to look at what it's like to be, and, and we have a pretty wide version of, or wide definition of producing. The people who come to our program are interested in producing a wide variety of projects. They all have very different artistic sensibilities. Um, so it, it really an MFA gives you a combination of what is the big picture of making theater and producing theater while providing the ability to study very much in depth. And so it really is a kind of, some days a, it, it, they work together, they work synchronistically. Um, some days there's a little push and pull between the big picture and the in-depth study. But we really, we want people to get both. It's an opportunity to expand your toolkit to strengthen the tools you have at your disposal in a highly competitive environment, regardless of where you practice theater. Uh, you program an MFA program, the program at Columbia provides you with colleagues. Um, you will, your class, your cohort, those folks will be colleagues for life. Um, and you also meet people in the other disciplines within the theater. So you'll meet directors, you'll meet playwrights, you'll meet actors, and you find folks who are interested in the same kind of work that you are. Um, a tremendous opportunity for networking. The Columbia MFA, our, our program, um, you, you saw a picture a little bit ago of Dodge Hall. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but the management and producing students, your campus is actually all over New York City. And so your opportunity to network with people working in the profession, working professionally in New York City, in both the commercial and the not-for-profit sector, um, is probably second to none. And the networking opportunities that come out of that, that will, again, go with you as you graduate and move on into your career, are pretty extensive. Your faculty, the teachers, are working professionals in the field. Um, the teaching is... We hold, the t we hold our teaching to a high standard. We take it really seriously. Um, and most of the people who teach you, if not all of them, um, are working professionals in the field. Um, so you are not only, you're, you're learning from people who are teachers, but you're learning from people who are bringing their real life experience into the classroom. And finally, I think um, an MFA one hopes it provides you with inspiration, and one hopes that it provides you with, it helps fuel the spark that you are carrying inside you about the work that you want to do. You wouldn't be listening to us if you didn't have a sense of what you wanted to be and have some passion about that. The MFA is, is meant to fuel that. Uh, so that's kind of an overview. I leave anything out? No, that's great. Uh, I speak with people all year long uh, who are just beginning to question whether graduate school is right for them. And usually the first thing that I say is, why an MFA? You don't have to have an MFA. Uh, a lot of people are really successful finding their place within the business and working their way up within the business. Um, the MFA can give you that overview. It can give you an opportunity to dabble in different areas. It would be very hard to be in the working world and stay in one job for three months and then move to right. another job for three months and another for three months. Um, but in a way, the, the MFA program gives you the excuse. It gives you the opportunity. Um, your mission is to dabble, is to explore areas that you might not have thought about before. And so something that we really like is this sense of exploration that students have in the program, and when someone starts the program thinking they want to be one thing, and a year that's later, that's all changed. That's a good thing when that happens. That's, that's the, an exciting that's, thing. That's the best. Thing. And and I think another thing that I'm that we're seeing more and more of, or hearing more and more, are folks who are coming into the program with the sense that the field is changing, that they're interested in looking at the life performing arts and. For instance, how does that intersect with technology? What's that going to look like in 10 years? And it's a place to explore questions that don't have easy answers. And so it, it may be that you have a skill set you want to build, or it may be that you have an idea of the kind of producer you want to be, and no, you, you don't know how to do that. 
um, this is a good place to come to learn those things. Or, and you may very well be mission driven, where it's not necessarily about what show you want to produce or what theater you want to produce in, but what sort of change you want to bring to the industry. To the field, and to the industry. Uh, and, and all of that is fair game. Uh, I, I will often say to people, you know, there's so many, there are many different kinds of theater management programs, fewer producing programs. Uh, and if you're going to spend the time and money to get an MFA, you want to make sure that the program is going to give you what you need. Uh, for me, an MFA program, any graduate program really, that, that's training you professionally, should give you three things. That's a really solid curriculum, it's the opportunity for collaboration, and it's contacts. So that you're you're learning, you're seeing what's going on in the real world, and you have this entree into the professional world. I think of it, the Columbia program as being very organic. We start from the very beginning, studying and working. It's seamless, and you just are part of the profession from the very first moment that you're in the program, and that just increases. So that by the time you're ready to leave, we don't have to start training you on how to move into the profession. You're already there. You're already there. Right. Well said. Um, so a little bit of an overview of the program itself, just some, some nuts and bolts. We admit uh, between 8 to 10 students per year, depending on the year. Uh, currently, the, the first year class that we just admitted is nine, nine students. Right. Uh, it's a three-year program, which means two years full-time coursework, uh, two years, four semesters, each semester is 14 weeks. So it goes by really quickly. Really quickly. Uh, 28 weeks per year, 56 weeks total in as far as the academic component. Um, and uh, so... That's, and 60 credits is the minimum through electives, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, you can wind up taking more than 60 credits and experiment in, in a variety so of different areas. So most people are taking five to six classes a term. Yes, yeah, five to six classes per term, um, which winds up being somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 18 Correct. credits per semester. Uh, in, the, and in the third year, most people are either finishing up uh, their internship requirements uh, or working full time while they're also doing research and writing, writing for their thesis. thesis. Yeah. Um, a few other basic requirements. Uh, there is a producing and management requirement. That means uh, when you are in the program, you have to produce or be the general manager for at least one project with Columbia content. This is a requirement that we changed up a few years ago. It used to be that you would just be paired up with another director, playwright, someone in the program who already had a project. And the problem was that didn't really work very well for anybody. There, was no, there wasn't necessarily a relationship there. It wasn't necessarily a project that the producer or manager was passionate about. And a few years ago, what we decided was we're going to change that, the nature of that requirement. And instead, it's up to the students to figure out who they want to work with uh, and what type of projects they want to work on. And all of a sudden, by freeing everyone, well, what did that do? It meant that the producers had to see everybody else's work and had to be talking to all their colleagues in the other concentrations uh, because they had to figure out who they connected with and what type of work they responded to. And they would work on, since they were starting to get to know people well and get to know their work well, they worked on one project and they fulfilled the assignment and then all of a sudden everybody else wanted to work with them. Or maybe they built a relationship with that particular director or playwright that then continued over their entire time in the program. And since we've made that change, it's very much the case that um, this requirement has actually created, uh, it's creating great partnerships and opportunities and where it used to be something people I think sometimes rolled their eyes about and had to do because it was a requirement and that was all it was. Now people are really, a lot of folks are really excited about the projects that they're undertaking. And developing relationships that are lasting beyond graduate school, mm -hmm. which is really wonderful. 
Uh, there's a, a, the in requirement of three internships, and we put internships in quotation marks. Internships could be full-time paying jobs, they can be observerships, they can be what are now being called fellowships, they can be full-time, they can be part-time. It's basically some experience in the field. Uh, and again, while we require three, most students wind up doing more. more. And we, you know, that's a place where you work with your advisor to figure out what you either, where you want to concentrate, and it's a balance of this is something I think I might want to do when I'm out of school, or it's, this is something I'm pretty sure I don't want to do, but I want to make sure that I don't want to do it, or this is something I know I'm not going to do, but I want to understand it because it's foundational. You know, I, I know I don't want, I don't want to be a fundraiser, I don't want to be a development director, but I know I have to understand about raising money or raising capital, and this internship will give me that. And so it's, they're all over the map in terms of what you can do. And they don't even necessarily have to be in New York City. No. We've had people during the summers or in the third year do internships in other cities or, and even other countries. Uh, collaboration weekend is the very first requirement of the, of the program. You take care of it the very first weekend. Mm -hmm at the program, and that's an opportunity for all the incoming students in the six concentrations to work together, and basically it's a giant ice-breaking opportunity, and you work together to put on a show. And right here on this page is a picture of our current first-year students, the class of 2022, and they made t-shirts for Collaboration Weekend. So there they are in their um, t-shirts, posing uh, during Collaboration Weekend. Uh, and that's really just the beginning of the opportunities to not only get to know everyone in the incoming class and in, in the producing concentration, but also the other artists in the other concentrations as well. Um, the, there is a crew assignment. Uh, our MFA program, although there is an undergraduate program, theater program at Columbia, we are not directly connected. And so whereas in most institutions, or many institutions, the undergraduate theater population serves the graduate program, that is not the case uh, at Columbia. So really what happens is the first year MFA students uh, serve the third year MFA students who are doing their thesis productions, and then that just continues to roll forward. And so by the time uh, the first years are in their third year, those incoming first years are, are helping uh, with their, uh, their productions. And crew assignments can really range from doing running crew, which I highly recommend for anyone who hasn't had that experience. Uh, it can be running a light board, it can be working costumes, um, but often for the managers and producers, it's serving as the company manager for the production, which is a great way to begin to learn how to navigate the sort of business structure at Columbia and to, to prep for a production that you may be producing or general managing. Uh, also, as part of the crew assignment, uh, to be completely transparent, there is a load-in, there is a strike. Everybody needs to do it, and, and everybody gets through it. It's not always fun, but it's part of the game. And the, the actual crew assignments, I think, help help you when you're then beginning to think about what's an effective producing and management. You know, what 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 is helpful, what's what does it look like? What does the production look like when you're looking at what do you want to produce? Because it gets you in the building. Yeah. And I think it's hard to talk about the stage hands union if you've never truly experienced what it's like to actually work on a show and do a load in and sort of put yourself in their shoes for a few hours. Uh not necessarily a requirement of the program, but it really is a requirement of the program, it is seeing as much theater as humanly possible. And uh, in addition to all the theater happening at Columbia, and usually in any given weekend, there are at least two or three student productions taking place in the graduate program, uh, we make a lot of free tickets available. And those are courtesy of the theater companies and producers all throughout New York City, um, some of whom have a direct relationship and are alumni or teachers in the program and others that really want Columbia students as their audience. 
There's no way, I mean, we believe really strongly that there is no way that you can become a strong manager, producer, a strong theater maker if you don't see a lot of work. And this is an opportunity while you're here. I mean, one of the reasons, one of the great things about going to school in New York City is that there's work all over the city all the time, uh, you know, very, very different kinds of work, very different kinds of venues. There's Broadway, there's Off-Broadway, there's commercial theater, there's not-for-profit theater. And it's really the one time in your life where you're going to have the ability to see as much work as you can see without having to pay for it. Yeah. And it's an, it's an extraordinary opportunity, and I consider it it's kind of like another class because there's no point to coming in doing a program like this if you're not going to go to the theater as much as you can. And it really does come into play in all the classes. Yeah. Uh, it complements everything you're doing in the classroom. You bring conversations from what you've seen out in the world into the classroom. So it's, it's actually a very important part. We of use the, the productions, in essence, some of what you see in the textbook. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, there's the thesis requirement. That's in the third year. It's a position paper. It is not the. Uh, it's not as huge and as scary as a PhD thesis, um, but it is a substantial piece of academic writing, and we will talk about that in a little more detail shortly. Faculty is made up of working professionals, as we've talked about, and this is a list um, of representative folks who are working in the program, and they range from, you know, some of them are folks who work in the commercial sector, some work in the not-for-profit sector, um, and they range from, you know, some of them, Robert Fried is a certified public accountant who is probably the preeminent Broadway accountant, Thomas Schumacher. Um, runs Disney theatrical, so you've got producers, you've got practitioners. Um, and just to, I'm picking out people to give you an example. And Ellen Dennis is, um, has a wide portfolio in international work around the world. Sue Frost is a commercial producer um, who's been teaching a long time. She partners with Chris Burney, who works in the not-for-profit sector. Um, is currently running New York Stage and Film, and they teach together. Chris Bono is a press agent. So there's a Jeremy Blocker is the managing director at New York Theater Workshop, which is one of um, our one of the city's preeminent off-Broadway theaters. So so and so really, as Tori said, it, they represent the commercial sector, the not-for-profit sector. Some who work in both, like Chris Bono doing press and Amanda Pico doing advertising, representing both commercial productions and not-for-profit theater companies. And there are people on this list who have, who move back and forth, who who have through through their career moved back and forth <laughs> between commercial and not-for-profit, myself included. Um, as far as the students, so we told you a little bit about the faculty, as far as the students, uh, we try to bring in a class with diverse backgrounds, diverse experiences, and that includes educational background. There's no one thing that you must have done as an undergrad. Uh, a BA or a BFA in theater is not required in order to come into this program. Uh, we have students who come in from all around the country as well as all, all around the world. world. And uh, that's illustrated by the, this one statistic in terms of international students. Um, Columbia University, about 17% of the student body is international. The School of the Arts as a whole is 28% international. And theater management and producing, the current first sec if you take the current first, second, and third year groups of students, 40% are international and represent eight different countries. And we think it's really important for to have all kinds of diversity in the room because not only are you learning from your teachers, but you're learning from each other, from what you bring and, to the table. And theater gets made in different ways around the world. And so um, it makes for the, the dynamic of the presence of the international students makes for a really fascinating conversation and also um, a real, sometimes a real deep dive into what cultural policy looks like, um, how do we think about stuff in this country versus how do folks think about stuff in other countries. And I think um, more and more, I think as we, as a, as a field, as we become more global, I think the relationships that we see being formed between students 
um, are going to bear tremendous fruit moving forward. And um, and really the the international piece, international production, touring, festivals, that's really been the big area of expansion in the program over the last three years or so. Well, we said it before, we'll say it again, and we'll say it here in pictures. Uh, New York City is your classroom. Uh, you have classes not only up at Columbia, but in offices and theaters all over the city. There are opportunities for field trips. I, this is a picture there of me taking students on a, a field trip at the end of the first year. We had spent a lot of time talking about stagehands and musicians and actors and everything that goes on in the theater, and then we put that into practice and did some backstage tours throughout the uh, Every the class is different. In my class, we don't move. Okay. We're, but we're, we, we're here. We're at TDF, right? You come to me, and so you're part of, you, you're seeing a large part of what we're up to, but you're, you're all over the city. Right. And we really try to, um, we try to give you an experience of being in the working environments on the one hand, uh, even if it's a class, even if, a, if it's a classroom, but in a working environment, in a professional theater, in a producer's office. Um, but also try to make sure that every semester there's at least some time spent up at Columbia. Right. So you have time on campus or regular class time up mm -hmm. on campus as well. We really try and have a, a curriculum that is balanced and it works for the individual. Um, so you have an individual program. There are core classes that you are required to take, but then there are also electives and you meet with your advisor and you talk through the kinds of things that you're thinking about taking. There's also all of Columbia, not all of Columbia, but there are program there are classes in other programs. Um, that are open to you that you can take their classes in the business school that relate to film. Um, there's a class that I think people discovered this year for the first time in digital storytelling um, because I've got, we have a couple of students who are very interested in ways in which um, digital media can be used to advance the theater and they're taking that class. Um, there are, so there, there's a, it's kind of wide open um, and we really work to make sure that it is a curriculum that works for you, for what you want to do, and for what you need. Those classes, obviously, building on the basics. Um, we look and at we we give you the the basic requirements, and we say here are the courses that you must take, and then within that, between the electives, the additional projects you choose to work on, the internships that you do. Uh, little by little, you're able to build out your own individualized program that really works for you. And and we really, one of the things that um, you probably have figured out as you look at different programs is the thing, one of the things that really distinguishes this program from a host of other programs is that we really are looking at both the commercial sector and the not-for-profit or subsidized sector. And um, we don't look at those, as Stephen said a minute ago, we don't necessarily look at those as this is, here's A and here's B. We really look at it as here's A and B and here's where A and B intersect or overlap. Most of us who teach have worked in both sectors or have relationships in both sectors. Um, I have spent my life working in the not-for-profit sector, but um, TDF is intimately involved with the commercial sector through a whole host of programs. When I worked at Manhattan Theater Club, we had a bunch of interactions with the commercial community. So the, there is, both sides are respected, and I think the, the thread through is that, you know, the faculty really understands that there's an ecosystem at work here, and that all the parts of the ecosystem are valuable. Um, so that's, I think, important. We also are looking at when we people say what's management and what's producing. Management is really, I think, one way to say is administration, right? Management is we really are looking at what are the nuts and bolts, what is it, you know, what does the budget look like? What are the what does the contract look like? What are the negotiations look like? What does a marketing plan look like? What does a fundraising plan look like? What does a grant application look like? But we're also teaching producing. And producing is needs all of those skills. 
you either at some point have to do that or you have to have people working for you who can do that and you have to understand whether or not they're doing it well. But producing is entrepreneurship, right? Producing is where you say, this is the vision that I have, this is what I want to help make happen. And, you know, there's a kind of sense of, of you know, what am I going to invent? How am I going to make this happen? It's like starting your own business. Mm-hmm. Um, producing, starting a theater or producing an individual production, that's starting your own business. And so we really look to do both. Right. And while some programs really will choose one or the other, for us, as with commercial and, and not-for-profit, we don't necessarily see that bright line, dividing line between management and producing. And I think that's borne out just by the practice in the industry these days. In the commercial theater, there are general managers who are executive producers and sometimes lead producers. In the not-for-profit world, there are managing directors, but then there are also the producing directors and the executive directors. And where is that where is that line between the entrepreneur and the administrator? Which kind of leads into the next two bullet points, if you will, because we're we want to make sure that you get the skills that you need, but we also ask you to think about issues facing the industry. We want to make sure that you understand the industry you're coming into, what the history is, what are the best practices, but we also want you to think about what does the future look like and what could be different. We are looking to imbue you with a sense of skills, but we are also looking to train leaders. Um, and we want to know, we, when, when we're looking to put a class together, one of the things that we're looking for are who are the people who we think have an interest and an appetite for tackling the big issues that face the field. And there are big issues that face the field. Um, and there are a lot of new things going on. And new, you know, what does theater want to look like in 20 years? It is important to know where it came from, sure, you have to know that, but you also have to figure out how best to strengthen it going forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we are, um, in part, large part, we, you know, as a reflection, I think, of the student body, but also the curriculum, we are national, but we also think internationally. And I would say also that, um, you know, when people come into my office in wearing my professional downtown hat and they want a co-producer or they want a general manager and they come in and they say, oh, well, nobody's doing, nobody's producing theater the right way. I'm going to do it the right way. I know how to do it the right, properly. Uh, And the problem is most of the time they're saying that and they have no idea how how it's being done or why it's done the way it is or what the history is. Um, And I'm all for, I'm all for saying let's make change and let's do it better. But I think, I believe that that needs to come from a place of understanding the history, understanding why we do things the way we do. And that gives you a much stronger position from which you can then make change. Well, and there's so much to be done that it doesn't make any sense to reinvent the wheel, right? And so part of what we're doing is saying, here's what here, here's, here's what's proven. Here's what works. We don't have to start, you're not starting from scratch every time. Uh, And this is just a summary of the the different areas of study. Um, Certain classes focus in a particular area. Others overlap multiple areas. Uh, More so in the first year where we're focused much more on skill sets and laying the foundation, we we wind up focusing more directly in particular areas. And as we move through the program into more of a discussion of issues and making change, uh, that's that's when we get into classes where they cover multiple areas. We're at the, as Stephen said at the beginning, we, we we are doing this in December, so it's the end of the first term, and I have found myself a couple of times in the last week when I meet with my first-year advisees um, where we really have talked about the fact that it's kind of like I I was saying the other day, if you were a music student, right, you spend the first term, the first year you're much more, you're learning skills and you're learning to read music and you're not doing, you're not composing yet, right, and it's as, as you progress in the course of your time, you move from the fundamental skills to getting to the point where you're composing. 
right? You're still if you're you're still working on your plies, you'll be doing choreography a little later. And it 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 actually it's a progression that I think helps you feel confident in your ability and in how you're learning and what kind of progress you're making. And that's not to say that we don't have people who come in who have been company managing right. or working on the press side or doing marketing. Uh, there may be particular areas that you feel much more comfortable in or where you have a great deal of experience. Well, that's great because you can bring something to the table, literally to the table in the classroom. Uh, but then there's also the, um, I guess, the opportunity for taking a wider view, a bigger picture look at the particular area, something you might not have been able to do when you're on the job and need, and you have a deadline, you need to get something done, there might not be an opportunity to learn about why something's done the way it's done, how it's done in another office, how it's done in another theater company. So we're looking both broadly as well as at the specific skills and trying to give everybody a foundation, recognizing that some people are coming in with strengths in one area and other people are coming in with strengths in, in another. another area. It tends to balance out. Yeah. Uh, but, and there's no reason for us to read this slide. I think you can, look at you can read this slide and, uh, and, and always pause and, and read it in even more detail. Uh, in the same way, we're not going to go through and, and read every single course title here. But what I would reiterate again is that the first year is much more skills-based, not exclusively, but much more skills-based, and the second year is more issues-based. Uh, it, we also have arranged the curriculum so that the first year is much more intense in terms of the workload, with the idea being that by the second year, when you might have multiple projects going on, more of an opportunity or more of a desire to be out in the field interning, that the workload decreases. Yeah, most people don't, actually most students don't do an internship, for instance, first term, first year. Um, they tend to start internships potentially the second term of the first year. Uh, so as Stephen said, the coursework is, a little, is heavier and more time consuming, but it's a nice arc as you move through these two years into the thesis year. And I'm just going to give a shout out to two of our newest courses. Um, one that was just started a couple of years ago, which is our ticketing course which I think could easily hold its own in, at Columbia Business School in the MBA program. And it is co-taught by Justin Carr, who's an alum of the program and who's currently the Vice President of Ticketing at Jujamson, and Nick Falzone, who is the Vice President of Ticketing, I might not have his title exactly right, but at, uh, at Disney Theatricals. Uh, the other course that is being taught for the first time this spring um, I'm really happy that Donna Walker Kuhn is coming back to the program. Donna taught with us for many years, and she's returning to teach a new course on equity, diversity, and inclusion in the performing arts. So, a little more about electives. Uh, every single semester, you have the opportunity to take at least one elective. Uh, in the second year, you have, you have the opportunity to take two electives per semester, if you desire. Uh, and there are many different places that our students traditionally look for electives. First is other concentrations within the theater program, uh, especially in the dramaturgy and stage management program. Um, I would, you know, there's... Um, there's a leadership course in the stage management program and a technical production course in the stage management program that some of our students take, uh, especially if they don't have a lot of production management experience. Uh, in the dramaturgy program, there are courses on putting together a season, season planning. In the directing program, if you've never directed, again, this graduate school is an opportunity to explore, to put yourself in, in, in everyone's shoes. And so if you've never directed, then you might very well be interested in our Fundamentals of Directing course, which is a course designed for directors for non-directors. Uh, and that's within the, uh, within the dramaturgy program. Uh, outside of the theater program, uh, there are courses in the film program. Uh, I especially recommend 
film producing classes and television producing classes within the film program. Because while there are certainly a lot of differences, because the Columbia Film School is very much oriented around independent film, there are a lot of things about both the both fundraising for producing and marketing and distribution of independent film that uh, to correlate to the theater. Yeah, some really interesting parallels between film and theater in that regard. Uh, there is an arts administration program at Teachers College, and there are a handful of courses that our students consider there. There's especially a public policy course that's become popular recently. Uh, every semester there are courses at the Columbia Business School that are open for cross-registration and Columbia Law School. Uh, there actually is one course within the program that's a required course that I teach in the first year that is at Columbia Law School, right. and it's, it's a seminar that's made up of half law students and half producing students, and everyone takes that. And then, of course, as there are as other parts of the university, and I have, you know, over the years I've had students who have been interested, I had a student once who did an anthropology course because they were interested kind of in thinking about the culture of the theater and cultural communities. Um, so I have a student right now taking a course in sustainability. Right. Um, had courses. People take courses in course, uh, courses in urban planning, right. languages. So uh, really, you know, if there's if if as you are here, you develop an appetite for you know you think oh I may want to really specialize in a certain there are other places at Columbia that you can take courses that will help you with that. If anything, there is too much choice. Right. That's, that's the biggest challenge in a way, it's how, to, how to use your time most effectively. Um, introducing the, a very new component to our program, which um, while we're not committing 1,000% to, we believe is going to be an ongoing part of the program. Uh, this is the first year of our new Columbia University Stage 1 Exchange Program. Stage one um, is a London-based program that's connected to the Society of London Theatre. And stage one runs panel discussions and lectures for aspiring commercial producers and emerging commercial producers in London. And we developed a relationship with stage one. Uh, ten of their participants came to New York for a week. Uh, we put together a curriculum for them where they uh, learned about how work is produced in America and really the differences between producing in America versus producing in London. And they had a great opportunity to see theater with and sit in class together and hang out with and bond with our second year producing students. And about just a few weeks from now, in January, our second year students will be going to London for a week. Uh, we are covering their cost of airfare and hotel accommodations, and they'll be there for a week. Stage One is putting together its own curriculum to, uh, to teach our students the differences producing in London, and of course they will hang out with that same Stage One cohort of 10 London-based producers and continue building on those relationships. And be able to see some theater in London. Yes, yes. A lot of theater packed into one week. Internships. Um, as we said, uh, you will do at least three internships. Most people do more than three. And what we have here is a selection of the companies where our students have recently interned. Uh, and really, the way it works when it comes to getting an internship, I think this is a place where advisors are particularly helpful um, between the two of us and other faculty. Um, we reach pretty deeply into the New York theater community and so if you have an idea of a place that you want to intern, we can certainly make it possible for you to get in the door to have an interview. There are very few places that are not interested in having a an intern from the program in principle, so it's really a matter of figuring out schedule and whether or not what you need lines up or is in alignment with what the producer needs. But you can see here that this is there. This is a combination of theater companies, of general management offices, 
Um, uh, unions, we've got folks who've been working at the unions, people usually, often people in, uh, intern with us here at TDF, so it's really all over the map. Williamstown, there's an example of someone who did an internship um, that extended into the summer. So um, the inter they're out there and we work to make it a very successful experience. And unlike some other programs, we will not tell you where you are interning. No. We will work with you to help you decide where to intern, we'll give you some suggestions, we'll vet your ideas, but the internships come from the students with advice from the advisors and not the other way around. It does, however, mean that you know we, we've been doing this a while, so we also know there's some offices that at the end of the day aren't great for interns, and we know what those are, and we'll, it's not that they're bad offices, it's just they're not set up necessarily to offer a productive internship, and we try and, we don't, we don't tell you where you have to go, but we steer you away if we think there's potentially a problem. And our goal is to help you bypass the regular internship application right. process. Right. Uh, just a little bit more in collaboration. We've spoken about this a little bit already, or quite a bit already, and, and over the various slides. Uh, some pictures here on this page. Um, top corner is uh, is our new plays festival from this past spring, and those are uh, last year's the, the playwrights who graduated in 2019. Uh, we have one scene from an acting thesis production, and then in the lower corner we have a, an, a group of, uh, of third-year actors. Uh, our productions fall under the heading of Columbia Stages, and that could be a classroom project, it could be a first or second year production, um, it could be our third year main stage production and or festivals that take place uh, up at the Lenfest Center, our new theater, and around New York City. Uh, one of the opportunities for collaboration that Tori mentioned earlier is a relatively new digital storytelling lab. And the amazing thing about that is it's not just students from all different theater concentrations, it's actually students from across the School of the Arts right. who participate in the digital storytelling lab. So we believe in collaboration across the theater program, but then also across the School of the Arts, and this is one of those opportunities for that kind of cross-disciplinary collaboration through, throughout the arts. Uh, and here is the Lenfest Center for the Arts up in Manhattanville, which is at 125th Street and Broadway and North. Uh, and this is Columbia's newest campus. There are three buildings up so far and two in the process of being completed. The Lenfest Center for the Arts was the second building and we've now, uh, we've now been working in the Lenfest presenting there for, for three years. Yeah, we're in, the, in our third year right now and really getting a handle on how to use the space and students are now starting to experiment with the space a lot. Uh, it's also given us an opportunity, or given the, the managers and producers an opportunity to more directly be concerned with not only the, the shows, but also customer service and how a building is being run. How a building works, right. So a little bit more about the thesis. And then you get to the third year, and that, as Stephen said, that year you will write your thesis. The thesis is anywhere from 50 to 100 pages. The thesis involves you you find something you're interested in exploring, you make an argument, uh, you have a case statement, and then you back up that case statement with a combination of interviews. So that's primary source material interviews. You also often, depends on the nature of the thesis, you may do research that involves articles, writing, studies, uh, you would have you have a faculty advisor and you have an outside advisor. You don't go from zero to sixty. However, one of the things I think that we do pretty well is prepare you for the process of writing the thesis. I don't know what your rule is. My rule is I will not talk to a first year student in the first term about what they think they're going to write their thesis about because that could change two or three times by the time they actually get to writing their thesis. So. As far as I'm concerned, first year you're going, it, it's way too soon, maybe somewhere, well, 
I'll make a little note for myself if someone seems to be particularly interested in something. But really, it's the second year when you begin to really drill down on the thesis. You write a paper at the end of the first year for Stephen on a topic that you're interested in. And I think that sometimes is a kind of precursor of this is what, oh, oh, this is maybe something that I want to pursue further, but not always by any stretch of the imagination. And um, we also do a pretty good job, I think, of letting the second and third year students mentor the students coming behind them. You have an opportunity to hear from the class ahead of you about what they're doing and what their what their thesis is going to be about and see that presentation. So it really is it's a process we come to work with you very organically to find out um, figure out what you want to do. Usually by you know by this time of year, your second year, it's a good idea. People usually have a pretty solid idea of where they're going. Starting to develop their ideas and really the spring semester of the second year in in my creative producing course, one a big part of that class is so the development of the thesis, uh, brainstorming, outlining, preliminary research. So the goal is that by the time you're finished with the second year, you're pretty seamlessly launching into, into your full-blown thesis. thesis research and writing. Right. Yeah. And we're there with you with most every step of the way. We don't pick up the pen or sit at the keyboard, but we're there, we're a resource for you, and you know, I, I think we both feel very strongly that the thesis is an opportunity for you to explore something in real depth and to really think about something in a way that you probably aren't going to have time, a lot of time in your life to do afterwards, right? When you finish school, you're going to be working, and you're, this is a demanding field, and it consumes you, and it requires an enormous amount of your attention. This is an opportunity to really think about something that you're passionate about and get out there and talk to people and learn and make a statement. And the, over the people... Thesis, it's a wide variety of topics um, over the course. I mean, I, I just, it's, it's, there is, I, I'm hard pressed to think of an aspect of the business that people haven't written about, um, but they become. Or a part of the world. Or a part of the world. And, but they become, these are, these are papers that are often roadmaps for the next step in someone's career. And if they're not roadmaps in that person's career, they become resources in the field. Um, and so it's a it's a really it's a really meaty and meaningful experience, I think. And there's a secret, which is that uh, often the interview or the interviews themselves and working with your outside advisor is yet another piece of making contact Absolutely. in the program. Uh, and we have literally had students get a job from the interviews or advising that they've been doing in their thesis, and that sort of leads them right into a career in the area they've been writing their thesis about, right? So affiliated with the MFA producing program is the JD MFA program. Uh, those, the MFA program and the, law, the program at Columbia Law School, those are two separate programs. Normally, it would take three years to get the MFA, three years to get a law degree, and ultimately what happens is you apply to both, if you're interested in the JD MFA, you apply to both schools. If you are accepted to both schools, you can then elect to do the degrees jointly, and what that allows you to do is really take electives of one program as required courses in the other program. And in doing that, you wind up saving a year or possibly two years. So it is actually possible to get both degrees in two years, and there are, there are several people. Who Meaning that when you're in the theater program, your required law school courses become your electives for the theater program and vice versa. Yeah. I mean, essentially, you do two and a half semesters, uh, sorry, two and a half years, five semesters in the law school, one and a half years, three semesters in the School of the Arts, so that's a total of four years full time to get all the curriculum done, to get all your course credits in. And for anyone who is able to get the internships and thesis writing done within that period of time, and many of us have, 
you can then get both degrees in that four-year period. Some people will take that an extra year to finish up the thesis, but either way, you're saving a year or two of tuition. Um, affiliated, also affiliated with the Theater Management Producing Program is our T Fellowship for Creative Producers, which Tori and I helped found with, with Hal Prince back in 2005. Um, and it's a program that lives alongside the Management and Producing Program. We, have, we choose one T Fellow per year. They get a budget for development of a show. They are mentored by producers who are affiliated with our program, and they take classes in the MFA program. So they're sitting in class with the other producing students. Our current mentors are Sue Frost, Margo Lyon, Tom Schumacher, Jeffrey Seller, David Stone, and Oren Wolf. And we have on this slide uh, some of the representative shows, or one show that represents each of them. This is a program that's different from the MFA program, and this is not a program, um, it, it, this is a program for folks who, some of them may have MFAs, or folks who've decided not, that they don't want the graduate degree. We look for people to have a specific project that they are interested in, so it's important to understand that this is another group of people that you would get to know, and it's another lens. It's not in place of, it's a very different yeah. relationship. And one of our key fellows over the years was actually, one of our MFA alumni was a key fellow, right. uh, or was selected as, as a key fellow a few years ago. Uh, financial aid. Uh, we give financial aid that is both need-based and merit-based, um, but unfortunately we can't satisfy all the need that we would like to be able to satisfy. The way financial aid works is if you are admitted, we will give you a package that will apply for the first year and that can be renewed for the second year as long as you're meeting the, the regular academic requirements. Uh, in addition, in your second year, there are opportunities to work as a student coordinator, and that could be as a faculty assistant, it could be working in the shop, it could be working in the office, it could be doing marketing for our shows, and that's those are well-paid positions that provide some additional financial aid. Uh, the fellowships generally range, if, if you're eligible for a fellowship, uh, the awards generally range in the $10,000 to $30,000 per year uh, area. Um, in addition to which, in the third year, there is a, an internship stipend that's sponsored by the Schubert Foundation. And even if you've done an internship in the first or second year, you get a, an additional stipend payment in the third year. Uh, you can find, get more information about the cost of attendance and, and financial aid on the website. Um, as you'll see, the first two, the, the third year is much, much less expensive to, than, attend. to attend than years one and two. Uh, what we would also say is, if you think this program is right for you, you should apply. And we try to find a way to, to make it work for people. Yeah, we're very mindful of the fact that it costs money, um, but we're very concerned that we not lose people who are interested in this program because they're concerned about the finance. Um, if you think this is the right program for you, you should apply to this program. And then if you still feel that way and we all come to the, we all agree about that, then when the time comes and when we accept you, then we sit down with you and say, this is what we're able to do. Um, so and we really work hard to make it work for people. So just as Stephen said, please, please, please don't say, well, there's no way I'll be able to get the aid that I need in order um, to, for me to come there and, and pass on it. Let us let us meet you. Uh, what kind of students are we looking for, Tori? We get that question all the time. We're, we're, we're looking for students who are passionate about the theater. We're looking for students who want to be theater makers. That's a phrase I like to use a lot because we're all involved in the process of making theater, whether we do it on stage, 
off stage, whether we're producers, whether we're raising the money, whether we're fundraising the money. Um, so we're looking for people who are creative, who want to be in the theater. Uh, we try and we really cast the class, if you will, and most classes are a combination of um, most times most of the students who we accept have been out of school for a few years between undergraduate and coming to graduate school, but every year we accept one or two students um, who have come straight from undergraduate school. Um, we're very mindful of trying to put together a class that will work well together, um, that will be diverse. Um, so that's kind of, it's, it's hard to put your finger, we're looking for people with an open mind, we're looking for people um, who have a strong sense of what they want to do and who they want to be, but they aren't locked into that. I don't think, I, I don't think it's a pro, we don't, we don't have people who say, I want to be in this, you know, I want to be in the not-for-profit theater and I want to be a marketing director and I know damn well that's the only thing I want to be. We don't tend to get a lot of that. Yeah, we want people who are looking to explore. Uh, we also want people who, um, uh, what was I going to say, um, who are proactive, proactive about their education, uh, who aren't just waiting for us to spoon feed them, but are willing to sort of take the lead. You don't get spoon fed want. in this program. Even the first year, which is skills based, where you're getting very practical skills, you're not getting spoon fed, you're getting the information. Uh, folks are readily available to you, but we are looking for grown-ups, right? We're looking for people who are taking a responsibility for their own professional development and want to move forward. Right. There's no GRE required in order to apply, so breathe a sigh of relief. You do not have to take the GRE if you would like to come to Columbia. Uh, there are creative materials that are required as part of the application. Uh, you have three choices. It could be a portfolio of different materials that you put together from your producing activity. Uh, it could be a portfolio of press and marketing materials. Um, ideally, if you're putting together a portfolio, that would be something you curate, right? Not just throwing together a bunch of paper or a bunch of files Please, into a PDF, that. but actually something that explains to us what we're looking at, why we're looking at it, what your role was in creating the materials. Uh, the third option is to do a play analysis, and that is intentionally a very open-ended assignment. You choose the play that you want to write about, and you talk about whatever you think might be of concern, might be challenging. Um, overall, I would say, what that assignment all the creative materials, the essays that we're asking you to write, we're trying to get a sense of who you really are. So right. be yourself this in your application. What we, what we don't say here is there is an application, and the application has, as part of that application, I mean obviously there's an application, but there are essays as part of that application, and I would say having been on the admissions committee for years, those essays are really important because that's part of how we get a sense of who you are and what's who you, who you are, what you would bring to the table, what you would bring to the classroom, and so um, that's that's the other piece that, that is obviously part of this application process. And what happens is the deadline is January 7th, uh, 2020. That's the deadline for, for the incoming class of 2020. Uh, we then get all the applications from the admissions office, our admissions committee reviews the applications and we narrow the field down to uh, a group that we will interview. Uh, we will then do interviews. I, those generally happen the end of February and beginning of March. Uh, and we ideally like to do those in person, though we will, of course, do them by Skype or Zoom or FaceTime. Uh, or telephone we have a lot more right. options than we used to. Exactly. Um, but in person is always better if there is a way, if you are granted an interview, uh, if there's a way for you to make it in but person. But again, we understand that geography can make that difficult and economic circumstances can make that difficult. 
So the if, if you need to do it not in person, we understand that and we facilitate that and that, that's not a strike against you. Not at all. We've had people who are literally in production. And right. how can we fault somebody for being in production? Um, but yes, and plenty of people are admitted who who are now able for one reason or another and to if, show up in person. If you're interested, another thing to just point out here is that if you're interested and you know that the February March time frame isn't going to be good for you, and for some other reason you're in New York, both of us are always available to meet with someone who's potentially, you know, who's who's thinking of applying. Um, so if, for instance, you've got to be in New York for some other reason, um, you can certainly reach out to us and we'll figure it out. We love engaging with prospective students. There are some programs that, and some faculty that don't do that. We do. You can. Yeah. Find us. You can find me on the Columbia website. You can find me through the admissions office and admissions office contact information. And you can is find me at CDF. So, <laughs> um, no reason to go through all of this. This is just a, a brief selection of some of our alumni, where they are, and what they're currently doing. Um, we are very, very proud of our alumni. We're also really proud that. Um, for the most part, they're really committed to staying connected with the program. We have a cocktail party every year, and usually we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 70, 80 yep. students and alumni attend. Our alumni come back to the program to participate in panel discussions. They hire current students as interns. They hire current students as full-time employees. And there really is this feeling of paying it all forward. Uh, so. Um, our alumni are proud of having been through the program, and we, in turn, are very proud of them. And this is just a, a little snapshot of some of those who are out there, some of whom were in the program back in the 1980s when, the, when it first started, up through the past couple of years. And ending with some smiles, the light at the end of the tunnel, the class of 2015 at graduation, and a really unique event. The class yeah, of 2018 not, got very lucky. <laughs> but the class of 2018 got very lucky. They got to go with Robert Freed and Karen Kuyos to the opening night of Hamilton in Chicago. That was a very special I event. I still don't understand how that happened. So, <laughs> anyway. But the great thing is, I think what that illustrates is just how committed the faculty are and the, the, the bond that gets created between the faculty and each, each class of students. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we are a few minutes over, but are happy to take questions. Um, so if you have questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves and, and ask away. Hello, I have a question. Um, are letters of recommendation required for the application? Uh, yes, letters of recommendation are required. Um, and uh, what we usually say is, if at all possible, to get different types of letters. So maybe one letter is from someone who, who was a teacher, maybe somebody who's a colleague, or somebody that you've worked with um, in one way or another. Uh, either worked for or worked with on a project. So just so that we can get to learn different things about you through those letters of recommendation. Thanks for that. Helpful. Thank you. This is always the awkward part. Yeah, this is very awkward. We never know who's out there, and you, you. We've asked each other so many questions all the way along, and sometimes there's not much left to ask. Um, and again, just to reiterate that if there is something that, that you want to ask and you don't really want to do it for posterity here on this, uh, on this webinar, um, please do feel free to reach out to us directly. Hello? Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for the the information session. It was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Do you also look for any kinds of job experience outside of the theater as well, or 
Is it open to like everyone's situation? It's a great question. Um, we think that everyone, all experiences, all life experiences are really valid. And we have had, um, you know, what we really want to make sure of when someone's applying into the program is that they know what they're getting themselves into. Right. So it would be hard for someone who has never done any work in the theater at all whether they're, it's because they're just coming out of college or because they've been in another career and they kind of think that being in the theater would be cool, that in and of itself, that's, that's harder, right? Somebody like that, we would probably look at their application and maybe chat with them and say, well, why don't you go, let's, let's talk about what you might do over the next year or two to, to sort of vet the idea, to make sure that this is something you really want to commit yourself to and commit the time and the money for an MFA program. And also, I think, to be fair, you know, there are always more people who we want to take than we have places for. And so, it's, if, if someone is coming in and they're really smart and interesting, and but they think, oh, well, this, maybe I want to do this, but maybe I, but this would be a fun way to find out. If we take that person, we're depriving a place to someone who's made the decision that this is what they want to do. So mm -hmm. you can have a variety of work experiences, but I think as Stephen said, this is it, it, it's not um, for someone who's trying to figure out if this is, is this is if this is for them. Um, we would I think in all likelihood then say, you know, you need to go spend a little more time. It's just that it, it's that idea that there are only so many places. That being said, we have people who apply to the program who are accepted and who do really well, who maybe have a full-time job that isn't in the theater industry but are volunteering right. or are working right. in the theater in right. some way uh, on the side or on the weekends or in the evenings um, or worked in the theater when they were younger and then went off and became lawyers or working in an ad agency or working in some other area of entertainment um, or or Investment banking, I'm trying to think of our specific examples, but investment bankers, lawyers, uh, advertising agency people, those are some that jump to mind of individuals who have then applied to the program, come into it, and been extremely, extremely successful. But usually they're, they're coming into it having experience in their lives, sort of being part of the, never having stopped being part of the theater. Uh, or having had a real strong connection to the theater, but then leaving it behind for a period of years. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Actually, there is a uh, question in the group chat. Um, Kaylin has a question on applying while completing an undergraduate degree. Is there any specific timeline slash cutoff to not be considered for the same year? Um, we, yeah, actually, we, the program um, works trimesters ending mid-August. Is that too quick of a turnaround to apply for this program in the same year? Well, it, it's happened, so never say never. Um, but it's, it is cutting it very close, and it's not something that we normally do, but it has happened. If it's really the right person, they have the right experience level, um, it has happened that we've admitted someone uh, who's in that position. But um, the, the, the challenge is that if for some reason the student didn't complete the, their undergraduate degree, then that would be a problem. They wouldn't be able to enter in the fall. So um, there's, there's yeah. a lot of exploration we have to we, do. We, it's if, sort of a case-by-case -case basis. If, it's, if someone is interested in that, that seems to me to be a little bit the kind of question where they might want to reach out sooner than later and talk about it a teeny bit, because the challenge is that if it doesn't work out, it's too late. It comes back to what I said a moment ago about for every person we take, someone else didn't get in. Um, we usually have a wait list, and by the time it was, it's August, that wait list is going to have gone somewhere else. So I think that's the, I think it would be yeah. really worth a conversation. 
with Stephen about the particulars before you go through the process of applying um, for this year. Yeah. Kenny, is there anything else in the chat? Uh, no, that was it. Oh, there's one from Sarah. Oh, yes, it just came in. Um, about applying and deferring admission, is that a possibility? No. Um, and actually, it's, it's not up to us. It's actually a school of the arts, and Kenny, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a school of the arts policy that you cannot apply, be admitted, and then defer. Yeah, that's correct. It's, it is a, a school of the arts policy. Um, usually, if it is a deferral, it's usually because, you know, there might be there was a visa issue or something or, or a, a dire medical emergency. But those are usually the two main reasons why uh, we allow a deferral. Right, so I guess not never, but... We, wouldn't, we, wish, we yeah. wouldn't wish a medical emergency on anybody. So I think the operating idea should be that no. Yeah, it, this is not like applying to an undergraduate program where then where you get in and then you say, I'm gonna take a year off and work we'll or travel or, or right. do something else. This is not a gap year situation, um, or even a I'm going to get in and then I'm going to work to pull the money together for a year, which is, is a valid question to ask, um, but it's just not something that we're able to do. Because, and part of it, part of it is School of the Arts policy, part of it is also the fact that, as Tori said, we really are casting an ensemble of students that we're bringing together. And the balance, you know, admitting somebody for one particular year, that doesn't necessarily you mean, mean they're going to work the next year. Yeah. I mean, the odds are if you apply one year, you're admitted, and then you withdraw your application. If you apply again, the odds are probably good that you would get in, but, but there are no guarantees. And we do engage in a conversation. I mean, we've had people apply who we have been very impressed with, but in going through the application and interview process, it's clear that, you know, this person is going to really, they would so benefit from a year working before they went to school, and we'll have that conversation. I mean, we'll, we, our goal is to, is to admit students who are going to succeed, right? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. It is, even with financial support, it's usually an investment of resources, and we want you to succeed. That's our goal. Um, and so we work with students, we work with applicants to figure out what's the best thing. And if we think, we've had a, we've, I think every year there are one or two people who we end up interviewing, and in the process of the interview, it becomes pretty clear that, you know, this is a person who's really going to benefit from a year's worth of work, and we say go out and work and come back and apply the next year, and nine times out of ten they do, they come back, they apply, and we take them. We really do, we care very much that you are applying and getting into the program that is right for you, so if we feel that there is another program that might be better suited for you, we will tell you that. Yeah. And if we believe that it's not the timing isn't quite right, but we want to build a relationship with you and want you to come back and apply again, we will tell you we'll that. Tell you that. Yeah. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, can you speak more about the second year study on creative production? What is Columbia's view on creative producing? Is it similar to the summer workshop at the O'Neill with CTI? Um, so, I think our view on creative producing is that it takes all different forms. Um, CTI is, is pretty much dedicated to producing for the commercial, commercial. theater. Um, we have a, a very, very broad definition of what it means to, to be a producer, to be an entrepreneur, as we said earlier, commercial or not-for-profit. Um, the some of the courses that are, that, that are the key curriculum for the producing part of the program, uh, one major one is parts one and two of the role of the producer, which is co-taught by Sue Frost and Chris Burney. 
Um, and as we said earlier, Sue, Sue was actually... She started in the non-profit. In the non well, she started in the commercial theater. Yeah. Then she went a good speech. To the not-for-profit world, came back to the commercial theater, and currently uh, is the pr producer of Come From Away. Uh, and then Chris Burney, who spent his career at Lincoln Center, followed by Second Stage, followed by New York Stage and Film. And so the two of them together have such a wide very so wide array of experience and very very projects that they've worked on over their careers and our goal is not to turn out cookie cutter producers who are all looking to produce the same thing in the same way it's about teaching you how to build your project from the ground up and, and I would say I uh, TDF is also we're co-sponsors of CTI the Commercial Theater Institute so I actually know a fair amount about the program and I would say that you know, the difference is, as Stephen said, we're looking, I, I think we're looking at creative in a slightly broader sense. It's certainly a much longer time frame, right? You have Chris and Sue all year. And, you know, the summer program at the O'Neill, there's only so much you can do in the course of that program. And I think it's more the idea that all producers are creative um, and that there's a variety of interaction with the creative personnel. But that, what, what we're looking at is bigger than that. And so, um, I would say that if you've done that, there might be some things, again, as Stephen said every, earlier, everyone comes in, you know, people come in with different kinds of preparation, but it's a very different, um, this approach is very different because it's, again, it's, a, it's over the course of a year. And then we have Tom Schumacher teaching his course with his perspective on, on his career as well as his perspective being a producer through Disney. Uh, in my creative producing class, in addition to doing thesis prep, I bring in a lot of different guests. Um, and my thesis for that course is that uh, there are all different ways for producers to be creative in their careers. There are creative ways to sell tickets. There are creative ways to take a project and develop it. There are creative ways of, um, of thinking about material and reimagining material if it's a revival. Of and I'm always pushing people because I teach audience development, and, and one of the things that I think is critically important for the field is that we come up with uh, new solutions that have to do with ticketing, with pricing, with how we build audiences, with you know what are the entry points, what are the barriers. So we're really we're really looking at that word creative as a the fact that you deal with creators, right, the people, the makers. Um, B that we're looking for innovative solutions and see we're looking for people who are thinking to use that overworked phrase um, who are thinking outside the box because the boxes aren't all working anymore I think that's it for the questions in the chat I think we're at okay well Thank you, everyone. Again, thanks so much. We didn't get your question. Please reach out to us, and um, we look forward to to meeting you in the future. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.